All right, I'm going to go ahead and start with some introductions and the outline of the event while people continue to sign on. But welcome to our compost and food waste workshop. Uh, we have a really great attendance already and a lot of people RSVP'd, so thanks for your interest. I'm excited to learn and excited to bring this content uh, to you all. My name is Maddie and I'm the program director at Debris Free Oceans. And so I help manage a lot of our programs. And now that we are social distancing, a lot of this is virtual. So we've been putting on uh, workshops recently via Zoom like this one uh, in hopes of continuing to bring education to you guys, continuing to gather as much as we can virtually and uh, keep learning and taking advantage of this time. So uh, I'm excited to have a bunch of awesome panelists and organizations with us today. Uh, going to have them introduce themselves when it's their time to speak, just to kind of continue with the start of this and uh, keep moving. But uh, before I go through the outline of who all is here, uh, just some housekeeping for how the event's gonna go. As you guys can tell, this is not in formal webinar mode. And uh, we did that on purpose because we want people to, if they are comfortable, uh, turn on their cameras, turn, off their, or turn on their audio, and ask questions and uh, engage and discuss as much as possible uh, if you're comfortable. That being said, uh, this is being streamed to Facebook Live and we are gonna record it and post it onto our IGTV. So if you don't wanna be recorded, just make sure you turn off uh, your audio and your video. Uh, also, since we're not in webinar mode and you're able to chat when people are speaking, please remain muted or don't take offense if we mute you. Uh, we just want to make sure the speakers remain kind of as the highlighted video and again don't have to talk over background noise and we're going to pause for questions after each speaker so feel free to uh, at that point turn off your or turn on your video and ask any questions or you can put questions in the chat and we'll be monitoring those and answering those during the question breaks as well and then also wanted to mention that the slides are going to be emailed out to everyone at the end of the presentation and there are linked resources so don't feel like you need to take a ton of notes uh, just enjoy it and we'll send this content out afterwards so for the outline of the event um, i'm going to start with just a little bit of information about food waste especially here in the united states and then uh, hand it over to sana she's with us from miami beach botanical garden just going to talk about their community compost initiative and just dive into a little more of the science of composting and why it's important for the environment. And then we're going to have a bunch of different speakers, well, four people go through varying complex levels of complexity of compost that they use in their backyards. Hopefully you guys can connect with one, find one that feels right for you and try it out after this workshop. And then finally, we have Julie with us from Delibles and The Yard, who's going to talk about uh, compost, I'm not composting, meal prep and also fermentation and food storage so that we can uh, stop this food waste from the source with our management of our food. And then we have a Kahoot quiz, a couple of questions, see if you're paying attention. It's fun and interactive, so stick around if you want to do that and the winner of the quiz will win a free Debris Free Oceans reusable bag made from cotton and also reusable straws. So, um, like I said, I'm gonna have the panelists introduce themselves once their time to talk, so I'm just gonna jump into a couple of introductory slides and then hand it over to our experts. So just a quick background about Debris Free Oceans. We are a 501c3 nonprofit and we're dedicated to eradicating marine debris through engaging local communities to responsibly manage waste. Um, so that being said, a lot of our programs, one of the big popular ones are our cleanup initiatives where we do beach cleanups, scuba cleanups, kayak cleanups. Um, and so we get to get out there and show the community the problem firsthand, engage them with being a part of removing it, but then also educate them about ways that they can stop this pollution at the source. And we also educate schools uh, within schools directly. So we'll go and visit schools throughout Miami-Dade County and give presentations. We've actually educated over 8,000 students in South Florida and do virtual education uh, like this. So if you're a professor tuning in, please reach out if you want us to visit. And then uh, we also do sustainability consulting. So we'll work with businesses to reduce or eliminate uh, plastic waste from their 
businesses. So if you're a business, also feel free to reach out. And then I just wanted to include this slide here that has our mission statement, uh, inspiring local communities to responsibly manage the life cycle of plastics and waste as part of the global initiative to eradicate marine debris. And I bring this up because a lot of our work and a lot of the work of other uh, organizations on the same mission really focuses on plastics. And that's because I like to call plastics the perp or the perpetrator. They really are the some of the worst type of debris we have out there just because they're made from oil, they persist forever, I could go on forever. Um, but we really want to encourage people to have these kinds of conversations about all the materials and items that you're using in life. Like we should have a type of life cycle analysis for everything that we're consuming as consumers. Where, where is it coming from? What are the emissions associated with its production? How is it when we end up using it? Is it good for us? Does it last a long time? And then at the end of its life cycle, where does it go? What does it do there? Is it cycled back? Does it let uh, persist and have harmful impacts? We need to think about that with everything that we're using. And so today we're considering that when it comes to food waste. So again, excited to be having this conversation about food waste. So then just a couple of statistics about food waste in the United States. Uh, every year we throw out the equivalent of 1,000 Empire State Buildings of food waste. And that's actually the equivalent of 30 to 40% of the US food supply, which is crazy. Uh, just bringing this down on a person to person basis, that equates to about 219 pounds per person per year and about $1,600 per family per year. So it's a lot going to waste. And it's just kind of crazy that we have all this food going to waste, but also simultaneously have high levels of food insecurity in the United States. So these figures are from the US Department of Agriculture showing uh, food insecurity over time, hovering at about 15% in the United States. And then this figure on the right actually divides it into uh, socio-demographic groupings. And I think it's important to point out that this food insecurity disproportionately affects black and brown communities. So when we're talking about food waste, when we're learning about it, this is something we need to consider and make sure that we're raising awareness about and considering when we're looking for solutions. And then, Quickly, uh, just a touch on greenhouse gas emissions. I know Sana is going to go into this a little bit more, but uh, I thought this stat was pretty astounding where uh, for global greenhouse gas emissions, about 25% of that is from food, and that can be food production and food waste. But then within that 25% for food, 25% of that is from food waste emissions. That equates to about 6% of global emissions being due to food waste globally, which is crazy. And I also wanted to point out briefly, so this figure is from Feeding America and it shows food waste generated in the United States by uh, different sectors. And I feel like it's really easy to kind of blame big supermarkets and say, oh, this is probably coming from these uh, uh, yeah, consumer facing businesses they refer to here from supermarkets. But as you can see, actually 43% of this food waste in the US is coming from home, which when I was reading about this, I was like, oh, that really felt like a sucker punch. But I think we need to think of this as exciting because by educating people about ways to be more responsible with food waste, we can actually have a really huge impact just as home consumers alone. So that's exciting. Uh, I think I have two more slides. Um, wanted to add also that using composting to solve, or you can use composting to solve not only food waste problems, but also plastic pollution problems. So this uh, figure on the left is from the Ocean Conservancy uh, International Coastal Cleanup Day data. And it's the top items collected, millions of pieces collected around the world in just a single day. And a lot of these items like plastic straws, plastic cups, plastic uh, plates have compostable alternatives. So if we can encourage people to switch to uh, naturally sourced compostable products that uh, will break down in the environment, we can contribute to reducing some of these numbers. 
So I wanted to quickly plug the Debris Free Oceans Responsible Products Catalog that is on our website. Uh, we have vetted these companies and uh, are featuring products that are backyard compostable. So they will, back, or they will compost in a cold uh, backyard environment. And they will also break down eventually in the uh, natural environment. And lastly, I just wanted to end with this slide uh, because and I was just emphasizing how those are uh, cold compostable, will break down in the environment, will break down in your backyard. And that's not the case for all products that are labeled as compostable on the market. Um, a lot of products that are labeled as compostable are compostable, I'm saying compostable so much, are compostable, um, but only under specific conditions. For example, at an industrial composting facility where you can heat it up a lot and add oxygen to the environment, which are conditions that these items do not experience should they be littered or should we try to backyard compost them. An example of this is bioplastics, which again, will not backyard compost. And they're a little bit better than regular plastics because they're sourced from starch and from natural ingredients, but they're chemically altered enough that they basically look and behave like plastic in the environment. And so I think it's important to distinguish between backyard compostable and industrial facility compostable because there's not an industrial facility compost in Florida right now. So it was a lot of information really fast, but if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Just some background info before I pass it on to Sana, who's gonna give us some awesome information about uh, their community compost and what's actually going down when materials are composted. Thanks, Maddie. Sure thing. Stop sharing my screen. Full screen. Hey everyone. So my name is Sunno Sullivan. I'm the head gardener at Miami Beach Botanical Garden. I'm really excited to be here to talk about composting. It's always great to partner with Debris Free Ocean. Thanks for having me. So composting is a really wonderful process and I'll go over some of the basic science, uh, why it's so good to do, and how our program runs at the garden. So the whole idea is turning this to that. So we're taking our food waste and turning it into a really rich soil amendment. And when we add that to our soil and our habitat, we're really increasing the health. So the definition of composting is the controlled biological decomposition of organic material in an aerobic environment, meaning with oxygen. Kind of a mouthful, but I promise it's not as scary as it seems. Um, the most important word here is controlled. So biodegradation of organic material happens naturally. If you think of the ecosystem, the forest floor, all the plants that come down will decompose naturally. And the top soil of those natural ecosystems will be filled with humus. Um, this is the part of the soil that's incredibly rich in nutrients, living organisms. It's darker and more moist, and it's recently decomposed organic material. So that's kind of the goal for healthy soil. Uh, we believe composting really brings together the community. It's really fun to do. This was the last workshop we had with DFO at the garden, and this is us turning the pile. So it's something we can do as a community. And our goal at the garden is just try to make it as accessible as possible. So when we throw food waste into the landfill, it not only adds to the mass of the landfill, but when organic matter decomposes without oxygen, meaning an anaerobic environment, it emits methane. And methane is a really serious greenhouse gas. So by composting, we can curb our emissions and not create unnecessary methane. This is one of the environmental benefits to composting, but there's a lot. Um, one is building healthy soil, another is protecting our water. So the building blocks of composting include these ingredients. I was once told that it's a lot like baking. You need the right ingredients and time. 
So you have your greens, which are really high in nitrogen. They're gonna be your food scraps. You can think about them being wet and sweet. You have your browns, which are high in carbon. Uh, these are more dry, like mulch or shredded paper. And there's gonna be a ratio between these two. And most oftentimes when you're troubleshooting a pile, the answer lies in either adding more greens or adding more browns. Then you have air and water. These are essential. Um, they keep the aerobic conditions. And the idea is to create an ideal environment for all the microorganisms that are actually helping break down the food. So there's a lot of them in there. There's over thousands of different tiny microorganisms from bacteria to fungi to invertebrates. And their whole purpose is really to feed off the organic material, which they turn into energy and they decompose. So it's like free labor. It's by all these little guys, they're just going at it and they're eating and everything uh, decomposes. So that creates a lot of heat. Um, a compost pile to ensure that it gets hot uh, should be about three feet by three feet by three feet. So one cubic yard and all of their activity creates heat. So you'll have medium heat loving organisms called mesophilic and they'll go after all the really rich nitrogen, um, all the food scraps. Uh, uh, apple core is not gonna last as long in a pile as a chunk of wood. Um, so these guys work so much that they actually destruct themselves and thermophilic organisms come in and these guys are breaking down the harder uh, to decompose material like mulch or a chunk of wood. And then after all the resources are depleted from them going through it, the pile will cool and you'll have mature compost, which a lot of people call black gold. It's like the best fertilizer around. So you want all of these microorganisms. What you don't want, even though this raccoon eating a corn cob is like the cutest thing ever, um, don't be scared about attracting pests because this goes back to the ratio of browns and greens. So you always want to mask your sweet food scraps with browns on top. Um, it's crucial in not having any unwanted critters. We've been composting for about six years at the garden. We have a lot of waste. We also have a lot of raccoons and possums and they don't touch our pile. Um, so that's important to know and not be worried about. So we're going for the closed loop system where waste is eliminated. You can see the broken loop. Um, it adds, it wastes natural resources and it adds pollution. So when we compost and make compost, we can try to grow our own food. Um, that's kind of like an idealistic goal. And we depend less on these disruptive systems such as modern agriculture and industrial activities. Those things have doubled our carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the last 150 years. So if we can get back to composting, it really gets us back to basic. Uh, you kind of insert yourself back into the nutrient loop um, of the world. You lower your carbon footprint and bring it all a little bit back into a healthier balance. I really think a lot of sustainability -ish, uh, solutions lie in small acts done by a lot of people which can be us. So we can cool the climate by uh, putting wasted food to good use. So when you compost, you take your food scraps and you get this really rich organic soil amendment. And when you add it to the soil, it really gets the structure better, it helps retain water and helps us grow our plants. So plants are the soil carbon sequestration experts. The bigger they grow, the better they get at it, the more carbon they can sequester. So they do this by photosynthesizing. Um, they're taking atmospheric CO2 and drawing it in through their roots where it turns into liquid carbon and feeds the plants along with the soil food web and all the other nutrients. So you can kind of think of it like backyard carbon sequestration that all of us can hopefully do um, when we get into composting and gardening. So the health of the soil is huge. Um, I feel like our planet depends on it. We depend on it. We get our nutrients from plants. Plants get their nutrients from the soil. 
So it's really important to have healthy soil. And since compost directly adds to the health of the soil, um, we can really increase the soil carbon and other benefits. So healthy soil uh, retains water, which lessens runoff and pollution and flooding. And then um, adding to the soil structure, it really just maintains a healthy plant growth and promotes a sustainable food supply. And so since compost has all the nutrients plants need, um, we should really stay away from synthetic fertilizers. They're petroleum based, they cause harmful runoff and they literally kill all the soil life in the ground when you apply them to it. And soil's life. So, and it was only in the last century where compost really took a back seat to chemicals and we really just need to get back to the basics. So going from a global level to a local level, um, our community compost hub program accepts food scraps from single family households and residents that cannot compost at home. So we understand Miami Beach, sometimes you're in a apartment and you don't feel like doing it, Part of our program does though express the education um, and promotes the fact that if you can have a compost pile, it's better. Um, it gets you closer to the whole process and gets your hands dirty and kind of connects you to your surroundings. The lesser distance between all our compost piles, the better because we're not um, creating emissions from transporting the waste around. So if you don't have to drive your food scraps to the garden and you have a little spot in your building, um, we can teach you how to do it. Coming soon, we have another hub opening, which we're really excited about. We worked with the city of Miami Beach to get this done. When you think of the community compost, you have to think about the land it's going to be on, the funds that's going to run it and who's going to manage it. It's really important, especially in an urban environment. Our compost advisor is Cassidy Fry from Gardens and Composting. He's extremely knowledgeable about the process and he's a great teacher. So you can connect with us online um, in these accounts. This is our space. Um, we have four stages. Stage one is the drop off. Stage two is when the pile is really starting to heat up. Uh, we turn these piles about once a week. Um, stage two, all the bacteria is attacking the nitrogen, like I uh, said before. Stage three, it's starting to cool down, but there's still a lot of high fungal activity. And stage, and they're attacking the carbon, harder to break down material. And then stage four is pretty much mature compost. Uh, we spread it around the garden on a weekly basis. We sell it in bulk, and we also sell a potting mix we make with it. The garden is closed right now, but we are accepting drop-offs through this gate over here. Keep in mind that that might change because we have this impeding COVID testing site and 19th Street might be closed and then we'll totally be blocked in. So that is why we're working to get the North Beach one open. And since we'll see a lot of great examples in the next couple speakers about how you can do it at home, I think this flow chart's a really great way to realize that there's a lot of systems and you'll find the one for you. So I'll leave this up for about 20 seconds and then I'll hand it over to Sophia and any questions if you guys want. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sana. You're welcome. It's awesome. Um, if you want to leave that up for a sec, oh, actually, it's okay. I was going to say, we've got a couple questions. Oh, okay. One second. <laughs> I was just going to see, we could leave that up while we did questions. If people want to try to follow the web and maybe comment what type of compost they might want. Let's see. So we've got, Dar and Dave were mentioning that they buy compost and soil from the garden. Yay. Thanks, Dar and Dave. And then, so we have a question from Mina. When do you recycle paper slash cardboard versus composting them? Um, I believe personally, I think composting is great because I mean, recycling for me, I don't think I understand it as well as composting it since you send it to a municipal fa uh, facility and they do it. When you compost it, as long as it doesn't have any like glossy plastics on it, you're literally turning it into this soil amendment that you can put out in your garden so you know 
like the end of its life cycle and you know it's only adding to the fertility of your garden. So I would say compost it. You can, if you do the wire bin, you can actually line it in uh, cardboard. It's a really great way to reuse that. Yeah, and I was just gonna add, especially with Miami, and actually Lena commented too, not recycling right now, um, it's not an option for people in Miami. Yeah. And um, just with recycling rates, if you can control it and have it in your own uh, backyard to compost, uh, that's also great. And our composting panelists are gonna talk about this, but there's a ratio you need to achieve and you need a lot of the carbon content and so I'm always looking for cardboard. So it's always good to have a lot if you start composting. And I should add, um, I didn't, but I get the question a lot, like do you have to rip up your uh, paper or cardboard? And the answer is no, but it will quicken the process. So any edge you can have open to all those insects and microorganisms to infiltrate, the faster it will speed up rather than just leaving a flat piece of cardboard, you can rip it up. Awesome. And then from Kiara, I live in Chicago. Would composting still work in cold weather? Also, I've heard vermicomposting is very effective. And we have a speaker talking about that, uh, but asked what your take is on that practice. So you would be surprised how hot a pile could get in the middle of winter just because of all the micro uh, microorganism activity. So I've never composted in a cold environment, though it's kind of on my bucket list, but I do believe it's um, very possible uh, just because of the activity it contained, um, it'll get hot. Awesome. And then we've got, so bacteria consumes the nitrogen and fungus consumes the carbon. Is that correct? That's pretty general. To be honest with you, compost can be simple, and that's the simple version, or it can be incredibly complex. Um, you can, the soil science of it, I only know a fraction of it, but I was always taught that that's kind of the simple way. But of course, there's some fungi that eat the nitrogen and bacteria that eat the carbon, but it kind of just gives you an idea of that the nitrogen is going to go first and then the carbon. Um, but Cassidy is great at explaining these things um, and he's at the garden every Friday. You can send me an email to kind of have either a one-on-one -on -one with him and then of course in the future we can't wait to do workshops and things like that. Awesome, thank you. I think we got one more question from Dave. If I don't have a lot of scraps, is it okay to just throw it in the garden or throw it in the garden and put a little dirt on top of it? And we'll touch a little bit about that too. I think it's good in small ways, but Sophia is going to go over her experiences of that since our experience is a little bit more on a bigger scale. Awesome. All right. So you've got, okay, last question. And then we'll keep moving on for time. But when do you know to stop adding and to separate what's decomposed? Uh, so you know when to stop adding when you're like at capacity. So at one point you'll be at capacity and you'll let that pile do its thing and you'll kind of have to find a way to start another pile knowing that that pile that's at capacity will break down and will be dispersed out into your garden. So it's kind of the reason why we have four stages because you can't let compost finish when you still add to it. Um, so if you kind of think of two stages, uh, let it rest and finish while you start another pile. Okay. Awesome. All right, we're going to keep going just for the interest of time. Luis, I saw your question and I know some of our other panelists have used a countertop composting bin, so they might be able to provide some advice. So that being said, we're moving on to the section of a couple of our panelists talking about their own backyard composts. Um, we're going to have Sophia talk about, I called it strategic scrap placement when I was originally outlining it but composting in small spaces. Um, and then we have Shannon and TJ from Moray, South Florida. Uh, like I said, kind of moving up in complexity, but they're all a little complex. Um, with Shannon and TJ talking about just their backyard bin in the backyard. And then we have Katie, our co-founder of DFO, talking about a rotating tumbler compost, which I also have and I'm learning. And then we have Lena talking about a warm compost. 
Awesome. Thanks so much for the intro and I'm excited to be here. Um, hello everyone. My name is Sophia. I am also with Debris Free Oceans. I oversee the internship program for college students. I'm also a college student myself and live in a dorm most of the year. So that's kind of why I've become the strategic scrap placement expert, according to Maddie. <laughs> um, so definitely don't have a backyard or access to a lot of space full time. So that's kind of why I've had to lead into this method a little bit. At home, I actually have a backyard tumbler, but that's only, you know, in the summertime. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about ways you can utilize compost and decomposing processes while not having a full garden or backyard to put scraps in. So first off, I just want to talk about overall tips. Um, I'm sure these are kind of a little bit more general and as you start to compost, which I highly encourage each one of you to at least research what method would be best right, right after this session um, for you just personally. Uh, definitely recommend freezing your scraps. So in terms of collecting your scraps before actually putting them anywhere for the compost process to happen. Um, if you store scraps like in a small apartment or a small dorm room, you know, rotting food tends to smell a little bit, but putting them in the freezer in an airtight container or even just a paper bag, that oftentimes just helps slow down the rot and stop the smell if you don't have an immediate place to take those scraps to. Um, and then this is kind of the bulk of what I'll be talking about today, but burying your scraps in pots and in soil actually works. I saw Dave asked about that, but that's something that I've been doing just on and off for a couple years now, and I've had some really interesting surprises come for it, from it. Basically, kind of like the end-all, be-all, and Sana touched on this a little bit, is if you give scraps and food waste the right conditions, they will break down, they will replenish the nutrients. Some versions of composting obviously accelerate that process. If you have more heat, it happens faster. If it's like a, just an environment with like optimal ratios and a lot of sunlight and a lot of water just to keep it all damp, um, that's also ideal, but really, any food scraps, any food waste, if you toss an apple core, you know, into a potted plant, it will break down. It just may take a little bit more time than having it in a compost tumbler or other methods like that. Also something I highly recommend, depending on your area, you may have compost drop-off sites available. So again, I know some people are from different areas of the world right now and of the US, so definitely just look up, you know, what city you're in, compost drop-off site. And you may be surprised, there may be a local community garden and even just local farmers at farmer's markets, if you're able to attend them you know, safely, you can ask farmers there. Oftentimes they do accept compost in order to help produce their food. So that's just another quick little tip. And again, like I mentioned, everything will break down eventually if it has the right conditions. So even just putting that eggshell in your pothos pot it will break down. Maybe if you smash it up, it will speed it up a little bit, but that's just like an easy way to get started. So again, I mentioned that some interesting things have happened. These are some potted plants in my home, in my backyard. So even before having a compost tumbler, I would do this at home with just like potted plants and soil that I had access to. And I had these plants spring up so on the left-hand side is actually a very small papaya tree. Um, that's the current size right now. I took this picture a couple of days ago. It just came up after me putting papaya seeds, I think a couple months ago in there, as well as some other things like eggshells. Um, and it hasn't produced fruit or grown very much, but that's the current size, which is really exciting. And it just happened completely unintentionally. And on the right-hand side is like a squash plant and that, later it eventually died but it was just really cool that things were breaking down things were happening it was producing a plant of some kind so just goes to show that even composting can just make your thumb a little bit greener so this is kind of a success story this is about a papaya tree that i did not realize until i would say like a couple of weeks ago when i was just looking in the front of my yard and i found this 
very new tree sprung up and it actually had, as you can see in the left-hand picture, a lot of papaya on there. So that also just happened from natural processes of me putting food scraps in my front yard, my parents yelling at me for it. But now we have a papaya tree producing actual papaya, as you can see in the right picture. Um, these were actually too green. We cut them down early um, because some squirrels were getting at them. So we thought they were ready, but they weren't. But you could still cook them and make a kind of dessert that way. So that was just interesting. Um, so definitely recommend you know, using this method if right now you just want to dip your toes into composting and what this can actually look like. It could be the smallest of pots, just putting in, you know, those uh, strawberry tops or whatever fruit veggie scraps you have. Especially, I would say coffee grounds and eggshells, those are actually really good to use as fertilizer for potted plants in your homes. So kind of what I just wanna end um, this is kind of a brief presentation talking about the most basic way of composting and reusing these organic scraps was to just rethink what you have a lot of. So you can think of it kind of like a waste audit. Um, like mentioned earlier, um, this is much better process compared to recycling, you know, taking those paper products and taking those carbon materials and putting them back into the soil so that they can help replenish the soil with nutrients is much better than sending it to a facility for it to maybe be processed into a new material. You know, this is something that you can manage before your very own eyes and just a great way to learn a little bit about nature and get yourself um, some dirty that way. Uh, something else that I will mention is getting creative with other scraps. So I know some people, they tend to not use citrus peels in compost just because they're a little bit more on the acidic side. But another thing you can do to it is soak them in vinegar. And that's like a multi-purpose spray that you can use to like wipe your windows, you know, clean desktops, that type of thing. And citrus peels, if you do have a garden by chance, they actually, if you just lay them on top of the garden, they help deter of rodents and other animals that may want to dig up and eat your fruit. So just some basic tips. And if you have any questions about being strategic, if you're you know, dropping off scraps somewhere or anything like that, I'd be happy to <laughs> give some advice that way. Thank you, Sophia. We got a couple questions. Uh, one, how big uh, are the pieces that you add? Yeah, so I would definitely, you know, try to go on the smaller side whenever possible. Like Sana mentioned, the smaller it is, also the quicker things will break down. You know, if you do have a minute or two to chop like the cucumber end or whatever the fruit or veggie is into just a smaller piece, that actually just um, is more helpful for time efficiency. But it varies. If you're lazy, you can just stick it in the dirt and it will break down eventually. <laughs> it will happen. Mina asked um, if you, uh, how do you put food scraps and not get a smell or see flies? Did you experience any of that? Uh, I honestly haven't. I mean, I think for the most part, if you're able to put food scraps in pots that are outside, there's so many other like elements and smells and heat that are all working to break down those scraps. So I've never had the problem of having flies. Um, I have, I do have dogs at home and I think a couple of times my dog, he likes to get into messes. So sometimes he'll sniff them out and take out an eggshell from a pot, but that will be, he's the fly that will happen. But I haven't actually like had any smells. I would say if you're doing it in a small space, like maybe stick to smaller things and things that tend to not smell. So I would say like coffee grounds would be a good thing to just put directly into some indoor plants in your home. And that's really good for the plants as well. Uh, and speaking of coffee grounds, I'm not sure if you'll, you might know this, Sophia. I personally don't, but Dave asked, he's heard that coffee grounds are too acidic for composting and putting on gardens. Is that true? I've, I've of... heard this in variations. I have a friend that's actually like, he has his own like coffee, like nonprofit. And he's talked to me about this a little bit. And I think it's like more so the scale of it. So I would just tend to, you know, tread on the side of just putting less in the certain pots. If you have multiple pots, like try to 
spread the wealth, but maybe don't dump, you know, your pot of coffee grounds into one plant every day. <laughs> Probably things won't go well, but I would look into it further. <laughs> and then we had someone ask, Kiara asked about eggshells, but we looks like we got some good responses in the chat about tips for adding eggshells. Make sure you boil them to kill any harmful microbes, dry them in the sun for a few hours. And uh, this is Brian. Hi, Brian. Uh, added that they can help balance the pH if you are adding coffee grounds. All right, cool. Yes, okay. very true. <laughs> awesome. So now we'll switch over to Shannon and TJ to talk about their backyard compost that is like a simple bin is kind of what I called it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, we are Shannon and TJ, and we um, co-founded an organization called Mores um, with a few other of our friends. And um, it is all about getting people involved in their passion projects uh, with environmentalism and um, specifically marine science, because that's just our passion. Um, but at home, we do try to be sustainable as possible, specifically around food waste. Um, and so I did another uh, work, or I don't know, a live teach tutorial thing with Debris Free Oceans um, about how I do use a lot of my food scraps um, in cooking for my dog. And so I will save a lot of them. And uh, but whatever I can't use for him, we do like to compost. And we have just recently, I guess this year, uh, moved out of a small apartment. And I always was like, I can't wait for a yard to compost. Um, and I actually knew Sana from before this. And some of her uh, work has given me inspiration to try to start it at our house. And now that we have a yard, uh, we did get started with that. So I'm just, we're just going to walk you through kind of our process and what, you know, our day to day would look like involving the compost. So here I have on my windowsill here is a little bin um, that I just keep dumping stuff in until it's full. Someone mentioned earlier um, keeping it in the fridge or the freezer so that it doesn't smell. Uh, we go through, I, we eat a lot of vegetables, we go through a lot and it kind of fills fast enough that I don't have that and this also has a filter on it. So we haven't experienced smell with this one. Um, it is new and I love it so far. It's all made, it's made out of bamboo and um, it was really cool when I got it. I got it as a gift. So um, I didn't really know much about where it was coming from, but the whole packaging was all uh, cardboard. So it was, all, there was no plastic involved. So I was like, all right, thumbs up already. Um, and so this just sits on our windowsill and we just add throughout the day. And then once it gets full, we bring it out to our compost. So I just want to show you a little bit of some of the stuff. Uh, we were talking about coffee grounds. I, I'm the only one that drinks coffee in this house, so usually just a little bit every day. Um, Eggshells for sure. I have tea. Um, I have banana peels. And so I'm just about to put some. I had Brussels sprouts for dinner, so I just left some of this to show you that that's going to go into the ends of the Brussels sprouts. I don't really feed my dogs, so it's going to go in to the compost. And now it's full, so we're going to bring you out to the uh, backyard to show you where... Um, and we're going to get to pass my gardens, which I'm obsessed with. My quarantine hobby has been trying to garden, and I do use my compost um, in my garden, so I'm really excited about that. Some of them here, some gardening. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to TJ when um, we get over here because he kind of has taken this on as his little project back here, which works really well for me. I'll just do the cooking, give him all the trash, and he deals with it. So, cool. Hello, everyone. TJ. Um, so I was just going to walk you through the process that we've kind of taken over. And full disclosure, this has been a learning process. I did not do as much research as I should have in the beginning, which is why I was super excited to uh, get involved with this so I could learn a little bit more about it. But uh, we started, we, we moved into this house, and it has the two bins. And I think Sana was mentioning that you kind of work on one and then the second one is the one that you have the compost in. So you're just constantly going back and forth between the two. Uh, but as someone mentioned earlier, they're not doing recycling for Miami. So we had to make an adjustment. So we took all the compost and we put it in one side and then we took all of our cardboard and paper material throughout and we put everything here in the left. As you can see, it's basically just paper and cardboard and boxes and we have been uh, very fortunate enough that so far, even though they haven't collected recycling, we have not thrown one piece of recycling in the garbage since quarantine has started, which is something we're really proud of. 
Um, our recycling bin is very full of aluminum right now, so it's, it's getting close. But since this has all began, we've just taken every paper product that possibly can go into the compost and we've thrown it in here. And so far it's worked out really well. And um, full disclosure, and we might look like we have a shopping problem, but we have been receiving a bunch of gifts. Um, so it's not because I have an addiction problem. <laughs> All right, so take this. First thing I'll do is I'll come over here and lift up the lid here. Shani can show what it looks like in there. Uh, so it's a, it's a good mix right now of, of both. So what I'll do is I'll take this nice bin and I'll try and spread it out. Throw some of the stuff around there. And then once that's empty, close it up. And then I will go over to the left side and I will get some paper products. And I'll just take some of this. What I've just been doing is basically just ripping up the pieces and just throwing it in there. And the basic idea is for every organic material that I would put in there, I've just been making sure that I put an equal or yeah, I guess equal value of paper products inside. And so it's pretty easy for me without knowing any of the science to know that when I open up this lid on the composting side, if it does smell or if there are bugs, I'm off on that ratio that they were mentioning earlier. So it's usually meaning that I just need to add more of the brown dry carbon. So I lift it up. If I see flies or if I notice any odor, I immediately just start ripping stuff up and throw it in there. And if I want to, when we get a box, I'm sure over here, I basically just take the box that normally would go in the recycling that they're collecting and I'm just placing it in the left side to be used for whenever we can. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the infamous Amazon box. So <laughs> it goes right in there. And once, I done, once I'm done, I rip, once everything's ripped up and I have a nice clean coat of dry carbon stuff over top of the compost, I close everything up, I go in, and then by tomorrow, this cute little bin will be all full again, <laughs> and we repeat the process. And hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able to give some of our recycling soon, but in the meantime, all of the compost we've been making, we've been just using around the garden. So there's Shannon's basil, so <laughs> we'll just throw some in there, we'll throw some on Whatever vegetables and stuff we're making, we'll throw it around our mango trees or our papaya tree that was intentionally put there, not <laughs> accidentally via compost. <laughs> and it's been really nice to, uh, to have that just option to, one, get rid of our trash, but two, to actually be able to use it in, in the yard on our day-to-day -day lives. So um, The other thing that has been really helpful is when it rains, we lay the cardboard out so that it gets wet and soggy, mm -hmm. um, and that helps it break down and we rip it apart um, when that happens as well. Yeah, it's been super, so anytime it rains or if I see it's gonna rain, I'll come out here. It's just easier to rip the cardboard when it's wet and I can get a bunch of pieces if I wanna just rip it ahead of time so that if I'm in a rush or there's an evening where I just, I don't have time to keep that ratio even, I already have a bunch of ripped cardboard and I just throw it on top and just move on and it, it takes care of the process naturally. It's been really, it's been really fun. Little project for me that I've enjoyed since we started. Awesome guys. Thanks. We've got a couple questions. Sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone asked about your container that's from Bamboozle. So also I'm going to follow up and copy and paste a lot of the resources people are putting in the chat uh, in our follow-up email as well. So I'll do that. The, it is the from Bamboozle. The filter on there is key and it has a little bit of a, a sealant so that if it does it's start tight. to get you know odorous, it actually clicks in a little bit so it's not just placed on there which is beneficial if you're going to keep it in your kitchen all day yeah i can't claim to know like how it's sourced and where it's made because it was like i said as a gift but so far i'm very happy with it and i'm very happy when i opened the packaging i think i texted maddie right away and i was like <laughs> there's no plastic in here <laughs> <laughs> and then someone added that this isn't a question either i swear there are questions but <laughs> somebody added that they actually have two bins, one for their greens and then one for their browns. So that's something you guys, people could yeah. consider. And then question from Luis. He is wondering if he should or should not use one of the compostable bags for the countertop composting bins, um, the cornstarch based one, which so, actually, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so I would say I, it's, I'm, I was excited to pay attention to this one because I have been on the belief to compost everything <laughs> if it's somewhat in my opinion a paper product i've thrown it in there but i have noticed that some things are left in the compost when you're done and so when i, I find stuff like that then i go okay 
this is not compostable. I remove this and then I know for the next time. So I've been going more through the trial and error process, but definitely excited to keep going with this because then I'll know without having to go through the mistakes myself, what to not put in there. I was going to see, I don't know if Sana's still there right now, but she, when we were talking about this earlier, she said, um, yeah, Sana, is that the green compostable bags that we were talking about? Yeah, so our system, because it's big and it gets really hot, we do accept the bio bags. Um, I don't think they're completely necessary unless you're picking up the bag and bringing it to your drop-off spot, because other than that, you can just put them in the bin and wash out the bin. But we do accept those. They're one of the few biodegradable things we accept, um, but that's just our system. I think it has to do with how hot it gets. Um, so not completely necessary, but if you want to use them, um, that's okay too. And on that note, do you have a brand that you'd recommend? I really think it's like Biobag. Biobag, that's yeah. some of those too. I can see what is in the bin tomorrow and uh, let you know, Luis. And then Shannon and TJ, um, do you guys need to take the tape off the Amazon box? So the Amazon tape, and I don't know if it's supposed to, has been breaking down fantastic, but the actual plastic tape that you would get from other boxes hasn't been. So I don't know if the Amazon tape is intended to be biodegradable, but it is, and it, I mean, it at least has been for me. As for the, you know, whether it's affecting the quality of the compost, I can't say, but it has been absolutely breaking down. Cool. And, and the process for me, I've noticed it takes around six to eight weeks from when you put stuff in. I'll notice that there's a level of compost underneath from when I first started. And if it rains, like we had that entire month where it essentially rained all June, uh, the compost process was sped up dramatically to the point where it was just in three to four weeks, maybe even less, I was just seeing a layer and layer of compost underneath the new layers that I was adding in. So it was, uh, the rain definitely sped it up for us. Yes, yeah, speaking of speed, uh, like about how long would it take till you could start putting it on your, your garden? Yeah, I would say it, it's misleading because if you look at it, it doesn't look like it's ready. Cause you're, you know, we're constantly adding stuff on there. So I'll put some, some vegetable, you know, the, the stuff, the scraps from our kitchen and it will throw the, comp, uh, the dry carbon on there and you'll go, it's, it's not ready. It doesn't look good. But if you go and actually put your shovel underneath there or twist it up, you'll notice that directly underneath is a layer and it is good. So it may not look like it's ready, but it, you, you'd be surprised how quick it is. But I would guess anywhere from that six to eight week range is, is a good time frame. But, you know, come out here every couple of days, mix it up, see what, you're, um, see what you have. And you'd be surprised that once you have the process kind of going, it tends to, to go a little bit faster, in my opinion, as well. And sometimes I'll notice that my plants kind of look like they need a bit of nutrients. And I'll just go through and I'll turn it or I'm going to come turn it. And then I siphon it out. And so any of the big chunks, like an avocado core, yeah. um, it takes forever. Onions um, a little longer. Uh, some things take a really long time. So we'll siphon it out. We'll leave the chunks in and I'll take some of the good nutrient soil just to sprinkle around um, some of the plants that look look like they need a little bit of extra love <laughs> <laughs> cool um well, i'm going to switch over to the next panelist now just in the interest of time i uh, wanted to yep. add that brian said that the uh, tape is actually biodegradable but the shipping labels are not thank you brian. Uh, but yeah right. for showing us that guys and i'm glad it's working out for you and you've started to use it in your garden yeah it's been awesome thanks maddie uh-huh. So now we have Katie, the, one of the co-founders of Debris Free Oceans. She has a tumbling compost. So I see someone mentioned that in the chat about a compost crank. Um, so she's going to talk to us a little bit about that and show us her tumbler. If she's here. Oh my gosh, she just requested to be admitted. She must have gotten kicked out. <laughs> she's almost here. <laughs> Let's see. Katie? Here she is. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. sorry about that. Uh, Zoom kicked me off right before coming on. So, um, welcome <laughs> to my backyard. This is my compost bin. I use a tumbler. Um, I'm also just gonna kind of walk you guys through the steps that I take, um, going from kitchen to compost and 
One of the things I really wanted to stress though was I basically had the amount of information uh, before starting my composter that you all will have at the end of this workshop. And I just decided I'm gonna go ahead and start doing this because I was on maternity leave and I had some extra time. We all have coronavirus, we have some extra time. So I encourage you, the time is now. You have the knowledge, you have the time. Um, so I decided to go with this tumbler. And similar to TJ and Shannon, I keep this little bin on my kitchen counter and I have different scraps that I throw in here, um, just whatever I've used throughout the day. Um, and I come out here and add it to my tumbler. So the cool thing about the tumbler um, that I have, there's two sides. Um, one is kind of made for that curing compost that you are not adding any more scraps to anymore. And then the other side is kind of that continuing on compost, adding more food to that side. Um, so I actually recently just cured both sides um, and used some of my compost the other day. So I'm gonna leave this one as the cured one and then I'm kind of restarting this one with some scraps. Um, so I just take them, I go ahead, I pour them in the little door here. Um, and one thing that I will say is I thought this thing's small, it's going to fill up, you know, I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. The amount of time it takes to break down this food to make it so small, I was so impressed. It really made me realize like we are sending so much massive amounts of food to the landfill that can't break down because it's in an environment without oxygen that's just piling up and piling up and piling up when I've been throwing food in here for months and it shrank to be so small and then I can put it on my plant. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, just kind of watching that process. Um, but anyway, so I put the food scraps in there and then essentially what I do is I just find some random pom fronds that have fallen around my yard. They're constantly falling. Um, in addition to the cardboard or, you know, those kind of paper egg containers, uh, things like that. I'll add them as the browns. Um, I just literally pick up the pom fronds from my yard and I take scissors and I just cut and add little scraps of brown into my compost bin. And that has ended up working really well for me because it's kind of almost like shredded paper already. Um, so I've really enjoyed using that and then it's not like these pom fronds go, you know, a lot of people stack them up on the side of the road and they get also taken somewhere like a dump or something, not necessary. So once I do that, then I close the tumbler and then with some strength, I turn it around a few times um, and I do this every few days. Um, and this kind of aerates it and does what um, basically stirring your compost would do and then you have it kind of all mixed in there. I'm gonna show you guys what the cured side looks like just so you can see. Um, and again, kind of like TJ and Shannon, I did this trial by error. So at first I kind of had some flies so you can kind of see in there. I don't know if you can really see, it's kind of dark abyss of soil. Um, but I did trial by error and um, I had a lot of flies at first. I was like, oh no, I'm doing this wrong. I just needed to add more brown. I feel like if anything gets stinky or flies, add more brown. I always kind of defaulted to if something's going wrong, add more browns because if you think about it, a brown can sit in your yard forever and nothing's gonna happen to it. If you throw a mango in your yard, it's gonna get rotty and nasty. So if things are going awry, just add more browns um, became kind of my go-to. Um, and once I started doing that, it was great. Um, I would give it regular sniff tests, um, which people would come over when before coronavirus. And I would always take them out to the conference and be like, look and smell it. It smells amazing. So one of those things that, you know, I was kind of intimidated to start because I was like, it's going to smell. Am I going to get bugs? Am I going to get pests? And I just was like, you know what, I'm doing it. And none of those things happened and they won't happen to you either. Um, 
because it's really not, um, I feel like I was intimidated about it. So I just want to encourage people to not be intimidated and just start. And it's simple and fun and so enlightening at how much food waste can be shrunk and used for something good. Um, oh, I had one other little thing I wanted to share. Um, so if you look down here, this is a mango tree. Um, I think you can see this. Um, so when you start composting, you make compost friends. So um, someone that I knew was started composting and they put mango seeds into their compost bin and they started sprouting. Um, so he gave me a bunch of them. So I planted one and then I actually yesterday used some of my compost around it and it's looking very healthy. And so I'm very excited. This is my compost mango tree. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the tumbler. So if anyone has any questions about that, I would be happy to answer any. Thanks, Katie. So we've got, um, Anna asked how long it takes to use. So I guess how long it took to get some soil. So I'll be honest about this. Um, I really wasn't sure when my soil was done um, because I was new to composting. So I kind of waited a while to see if my compost kept doing anything else. <laughs> so I think it takes about two to three months once you stop filling your bin, but I waited a little bit longer because I was just curious, like, is anything else supposed to happen? Um, but after a while of it not changing and me doing some research and realizing that if it smells like dirt and it looks like dirt, it's done. Um, then I realized that it was done. So um, I don't think that's a great answer to your question. Um, but I would say about two to three months once you fill it up. Awesome. Yeah, I have a tumbler too. And I'm I'm still working on it. I got it maybe two months ago and it's not quite there yet. Um, and it actually surprisingly takes a while to fill. Um, and it, it, you know, it really lasted for a while with me filling it and cause you start with both sides, especially so. And someone asked if that takes care of uh, this from Taima, if that takes care of all of your food waste. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No problem for sure. Then since it has the two sides, it's, it's got, plenty of space and then you kind of rotate between side to side. Cool. And then someone asked for your particular composting bin, your blue guy, if that, uh, what brand that is, so they can uh, look that one up too, what size and brand. I'm not entirely sure what brand, to be honest. I just ordered it off Amazon, which probably isn't the best place to order from. Um, but I did, a, I did research and people recommended it, that it was a good one. So I, again, analysis by paralysis, I was like, okay, just do it. Um, so you might want to do more research and uh, into that. But um, I think this is a pretty standard one that you would find on there. And then I'm going to do one more before we switch. Uh, TJ asked, and I'm wondering this too, do you use paper products with colored ink like cereal boxes? Um, yes, I have, um, and they work just fine. The thing that I've noticed about some paper products is that they are lined with plastic, and when I'm taking that out of my compost, I will notice that there's like a plastic lining that I'll have to remove. Mm -hmm. um, but I also encourage you, I kind of used my compost bin a little bit as an experiment to kind of see how different materials react in the composter, um, you know, so, uh, I sometimes get surprises in there. <laughs> and then, sorry, I know I said one more, but someone just asked how it would be on a balcony, just quickly. I think that this would work fine on a balcony. Um, it's actually pretty small. Um, it's about, I think, I wanna say like two feet by one and a half feet. So it really doesn't take up much room. And like I said, it really doesn't smell um, or attract anything. So, um, I think it would be great on a balcony, actually. It would work perfectly. Awesome. And then someone asked about worms, but I'm going to hold that thought because now we can have Lena talk to us a little bit about her worm compost. All right. 
Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Hi. Well, thank you so much. I am so excited about sharing this with you guys. Uh, let me share my screen right now. All right. Okay. Can you can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So my name is Lena. Uh, I have a blog called Minimalina uh, that turned into a podcast eventually. And I talk about minimalism, uh, how to reduce waste, to reduce con unnecessary consumption mostly. That's the part of min minimalism that I'm very interested on. Uh, and eventually I started very interested in, in sustainability, which led to my current career change, which is uh, I'm getting a permaculture design certificate. So I am very in love with everything that's being said here. I've been composting for so many years and you'd be surprised the many things that you learn every single time from different people. Uh, these are some of the things that I have at home. Uh, I have, I run a rogue <laughs> composting uh, community, uh, com community composting from my house where people come and drop off their scraps in my uh, composter here. I started one from pallets, so that's here at the bottom. And very recently I started doing warm composting for, for fun because I love this. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about this. Um, as Sena said earlier, there is a huge difference between soil and dirt. And like this meme says, one does not simply call soil dirt. It is not. Soil is a dynamic, natural body composed of mineral and organic solids, gases, liquids, living organisms, which can serve as a medium for plant growth. So soil is essentially infertile dust uh, that does not retain water and nutrients um, and dirt is uh, basically a living organism. And these organisms are fungi, bacteria, insects, nematodes, and worms. And so I'm, we're going to focus on worms today. We're going to talk about how they help re recycle and reduce waste. One time Charles Darwin believed that humans could not survive without worms. So this is a really cool quote that says, it may be doubted whether there are many other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world as have these lowly organized creatures. They're very, very important for the infrastructure of our ecosystem. So what are worms? Worms are not insects, they're annelids. And these annelids are uh, hermaphrodites. So in theory, they could um, uh, inseminate themselves, but because nature is so amazing, their DNA needs diversity, so they will still mate with other um, worms uh, so in order to share this sperm. And each adult will create oh, one cocoon. And by the way, there are 5,000 different species of annelids alone. So depending on the species that you're working with, you will get one worm or 12 per cocoon. In this case, these are the red wigglers, which are the ones that I have here in my bin. That's right behind me. And um, I get 12 for every little cocoon. They produce castings because they eat all these organic matter and casting is essentially the poop. They eat the organic matter, goes through their system, which is an amazing system that absorbs heavy metals from the soil. So there was a recent study that said that um, these worms could basically clean the soil that was, had been sprayed with fertilizers or that had been exposed to uh, toxic uh, metals. So that was a really cool thing about them. And then it stays in their system, but the castings don't have any of that that they absorb or the toxicity that they absorb. Castings are their poop and they're really amazing and rich in fertilizer. Oops, do I just go, oh yes. This is a graphic that's basically self-explanatory, but I still wanna um, kind of make the analogy of how the system works. Uh, similarly to our bodies. So our bodies have microbiome and essentially you could live of chemicals at some point, but it would not be sustainable for your body. Uh, you have many organisms that require the types of nutrients. And I like to make the analogy to the earth, to the dirt and the soil, the living soil as the earth's microbiome. So if these organisms in, in the soil are not um, nourished and in a sustainable way, then it's going to die and you're going to get the dirt that we talked about, the soil. So chemical fertilizers only target plant nutrients, nothing else, and the microorganisms kind of go somewhere else or they die. They're non-existent. With organic fertilizers, you create organic matter. It turns into soil nutrients that feed microorganisms 
and eventually plant, gives plants their nutrients. So that's the more sustainable way to work, go about uh, fertilizing. So here are some setups. And you have to consider these setups in order to how much space you have, what's your real estate, and you know, how much space you have for putting these, what's your demand on fertilizer. So for some people that have a lot of plants and perhaps a small yard with a lot of plants that they need to fertilize often, uh, I would recommend something like upcycling this tub. And, uh, or you can have multiple setups of like these plastic bins. So I'm also very interested in uh, what Debris Free Oceans does in terms of uh, reducing plastic. So I would recommend reusing some of these because they're usually either at thrift stores or somebody has one laying around. This plastic is not recyclable. This is the type of plastic in the format that is not recyclable at all. So if it's in the trash or in the thrift store and it's not being upcycled, it's definitely going to the landfill. And it's pretty easy to set up. You can get bins. My first bin was this little yellow bucket. And some people that are very, very talented, they can make them out of wood. Or you can buy one, you know, there's commercial ones that have this little spout. And I'm gonna talk about that little spout towards the end of the presentation, which is coming up. And there are other setups that, that are easier to manage, like this tube that goes straight into the, the ground. So, let's see. Okay, so where do we get these worms? I got mine from Uncle Jim's worm farm and you get them in that little bag via mail. Uh, but because I was just ready to jump in, it was just like the, the it's the more, most popular way for you to get worms from. But there are two local uh, uh, farms, I guess, that, that have them. The Fertile Earth Worm Farm is in Davie. And I just messaged her to make sure she is ready <laughs> to ship and is available for that. And she is. So uh, she does ship them. She's local here in Davie. The Worm, worm Whisperer, he's here in Miami, and he also has worms uh, for you to purchase. And to start, I would recommend 500 for a book, uh, bin like the one I have behind me to 1,000 if that's how you're starting. So these are the places that you can get it from. And I'm sorry, I'm speeding up because I know there's like more presentations after. Um, so what do they need? They need bedding, compost, and grid. So bedding is basically the place where they're gonna chill and kind of cool off or warm up depending on how the weather is. They do thrive between um, like 65 to I'll say maybe 85 degrees Fahrenheit. That's kind of like a good range. They don't like the cold and the too hot if it's above like maybe 85, they won't survive, they don't like it. So you could get cardboard. So yeah, cardboard, paper, and some wood shavings. What I would say about cardboard, and somebody mentioned the cardboard boxes from the cereals, is that they have inks. And those inks are not good for, for these organisms um, because they will get wet and they will be consumed. And worms are slimy. They have a slime to them. And if it gets you know, mixed with those inks that will start uh, dissolving, it's, it's not a good um, environment for them. You can also get coconut coir, which is kind of grinded coconut husk and don't be fooled this brick is not that small when you put it in water it'll be this whole bucket <laughs> so you can buy a few maybe perhaps just one that is not going to be as expensive and you have enough for them here uh, the bedding also they eat it so you want to replace or add as you're adding compost and this is you add basically everything that's compostable but there are some things that you should avoid uh, in order for them to thrive, they don't like to have things that are very acidic. And those acidic things are citrus, onions, garlic, some processed foods like, you know, raw eggs or, I'm sorry, not raw eggs, uh, cooked foods and, uh, you know, things that are processed. Um, don't add anything that has raw eggs or dairy or cheese, uh, oil, sauces, salts, sugar, syrup, no, none of that we'll try to avoid. Uh, because it's not good for, for their ecosystem. It acidifies the soil. Another thing that I wanted to mention, and maybe I'll add it here. I was asking Mary if I can talk about it, and was this compostable bag. It says 100% compostable bag, but we read, right? <laughs> we gotta read everything that says. It says not, um, where does it say? Not for backyard, not suitable for backyard composting. Where is it? right there. Uh, so we don't compost this in the backyard. 
uh, on our big one either because I've tried it and it became a slime. And similarly to the worms, they can process that and it would become a weird slime. So please avoid this compostable stuff as well. They can thrive in that. And then you add grit, which is sand. So most of the sand, I would call it native soil, which is Miami soil. It has a ton of sand. You can add like a cup of that because that works like grit, like, like fiber, sorry. Grit is essentially fiber. And it also adds some minerals back into their digestion. And you can use those dry eggshells, make sure they're dry, they don't have pieces of egg in it. And you can pulverize them in the, in the blender or just crush them very finely and they can eat those for calcium. And the making of the worm bin is, there are three different ways, I'm gonna show you these two. And it's essentially adding the bedding at the bottom. Here in this graphic, it says manure. I didn't mention manure before because manure is kind of hard to track uh, from, and what I'm saying track is what is the cow or the horse that you're getting the manure from eating. If they're only eating grass, then this manure is great. But if you're eating grain that has been processed and sprayed with pesticides or fertilizers, this manure is not gonna be great for your worms. So as I, I don't think most of us have easy access to that, but I just wanna put it out there because it's important to know. So you add your cardboard and paper, a really thick layer at the bottom, then your worms. And then this cross bin section is very interesting. So you wanna harvest the castings or the poop. And in order for, for that to be easy in a bin, in one whole bin, is that you put uh, the food on one side and the worms will follow it, eat it, leave the castings behind. And you put the food then the next time on the other side. So the worms are gonna go to the other side, area number two, and you can collect from area number one. And you can do that successively and until it's filled. After three months, it's completely com done and every they've eaten everything and it's ready for you to, to take. Uh, or you can try the stacking system, which is I think easier. You fill one stack with the food and the bedding, they'll go eat it. And then when they're done, you can add another one on top and they'll just move up the, the grid. And then you have the bottom one that you can just easily remove, collect and spread around your plants. It's very easy. Um, at the end, so I wanted to mention what is worm tea and leachate, which are completely different things. So the system that I have here, um, and I'm gonna show you while I talk, um, is not meant for it to have liquid, <laughs> liquid leaching from it or uh, kind of draining from it. What I do is I get like this bag. This is not my picture, but this is essentially what I, I would do is collect like a handful of castings and brew them in water that does not have chlorine because these organisms will be killed by the chlorine and that, sorry, that water would come from your faucet. Um, it probably is gonna have chlorine on it. So you want rainwater and if you don't have access to rainwater, you can leave the bucket outside for three days in the sun to, so that it doesn't have that much chlorine. You would essentially make a tea, but for that to happen, you need to aerate it. So that means you add oxygen to it. And it's a little bit more complicated process. <laughs> I think if you start with the worms that are, uh, I would say kind of dry, uh, it's e easy just to collect the castings and start this way. Uh, but if you want, you can get some of these castings, put it in water, put one of those fish tank air things and it'll bubble up, create uh, some uh, worm tea and you can put it in the plants. The leachate is, it's leaching essentially from these, uh, from the spouts of some of these setups and they're very high in pathogens. So those have to be diluted one to 10 parts. So one cup to 10, 10 cups of, um, of water. So it's complicated at the end. Uh, that's why I left the last. But uh, yeah, worm life is great. You reduce waste so quickly. Uh, within um, a week, they reduce, they, they can eat like a cup or have their weight in food. It's, it's very easy for them to, to eat all of that. They reduce you know, greenhouse gases and all the things that we talked about when it comes to composting and they are odorless. So if you are in a small space and you want to, and you have a small amount of compost, it would be great for you to have a setup like this because it would be kind of hidden. You can put it you know, under, I have it here in the office and I'm working <laughs> they're here, they don't smell, everything's great. They don't have flies. 
and well you when you use it it's it's an amazing fertilizer you have higher food and bloom yield and eventually they will save the world and that's all i have phew did it <laughs> thank you so much sorry that was awesome i know so much information to get through oh my gosh you have no idea <laughs> awesome um in the interest of time, I'll probably just jump right to Julie, but if you guys yeah. have questions for Lena, we'll definitely put them in the chat and we'll follow up with contact information. Um, I, I don't mind answering them in, in Instagram. I don't mind answering them there too, if you wanna reach out to me, so we can get to Katie real quick. And Maddie, can I just show you something very quickly? I think Lena's gonna like it. This is from, um, oh, I don't think you can see it, can you? I used to work <laughs> a, a warm composting a project in Santa Cruz, <gasps> California in like 1992 or so. Oh so my I, goodness. Anyway, I thought you liked that. Oh, cool. Thank you, that's awesome, vintage. <laughs> cool, well, thank you guys so much for sharing the diverse ways to compost and there's definitely more. So you wanna check out that uh, flow chart that Sana has in her slides. But now we're going to transition to tackling food waste from the source by uh, managing our food better in the first place when we're consuming it. So I'm excited to have Julie here to talk a little bit about uh, meal prep and food storage and whatnot. So Julie, right. you want to share your screen? Uh, actually, I'll just say hi for a little bit. I'll share my screen um, at the end. Um, so thanks for having me, Maddie. I'm Julie with Della Bowles and the Drill Yard and what used to be the Winwood Yard. And I miss you guys and doing our amazing community cleanup. So we'll look forward to doing that more in the future. Um, I will have a lot of information that I may not have time to go through on here, but I will be posting a blog post on DellaBowles.com uh, in the next couple of days that also reiterates a lot of this information. So um, be sure to keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Um, but I loved hearing um, Lena talk about, um, you know, adding to the microbiome of the soil because the soil is so important when you're talking about food and vegetables and where your food comes from, um, because you're, you are what you eat, but you're also what your food eats. And so if you're eating vegetables that's grown in really crap soil, they're not going to, you know, have the same kind of nutrient makeup as something that's grown in really amazing nutrient dense soil as you would with compost. And so you know, when you talk about buying local veggies or from farms or like knowing where your food comes from, it's not just about like where it was grown, that it was local. It's actually that those farmers are probably using great compost soil. And so those vegetables are like really nutrient dense. Um, they're going to taste better and they're going to be better for you. And they're going to really make a difference in the uh, microbiome of your gut when you're doing, um, you know, really using great soil. So we have a garden, uh, a whole side yard garden and food forest that um, I'm so grateful we have Little River Cooperative helping us with. And so we know that they're using that black gold in our garden and that our food is like the best of the best of the best that we feed our family. So, um, so with that, I wanted to say in terms of reducing waste in your kitchen, I think the most important thing you can do is just be really mindful and deliberate about your food um, and like planning. It's basically looking at the whole process of shopping, uh, of planning, shopping, producing, uh, preserving, and then composting at the end. So, um, so we really want to just like look at it as a holistic process. Um, and so, Basically, if you plan, purchase, store wisely, use the whole veggie, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, and then creatively use um, food before it spoils, preserve and ferment, and then compost, you've kind of got that whole line covered. Um, so I'm going to take my dog's collar off because she's shaking a lot right now and <laughs> making a ton of noise. Sorry, that was in the background. Um, so one thing that I think is really important is just planning ahead. And so every week I do, I do one big shop. You could do multiple if, um, if that works for you, but I do one big shop. And so what I'll do is I'll open my fridge and I'll look at all the things that need to be used up and plan my first few meals for the week based on that. So, so that's like gonna be my Monday, Tuesday. Maybe Wednesday, Thursday, I'm getting more into like the new items. So that's where I'm planning ahead and shopping for those, those things. I like to really um, see what's growing locally also. So I try to plan as much um, in that route as well. 
Um, but I also plan a day of leftovers because I know I'm going to make more than what I really need for each meal. And so by Thursday, I'm probably going to have like little bits and pieces and containers of things. Um, so I, I plan for that and I try to get creative with that. So there's going to be like the first couple of days using what we have already from last week. The next couple of days using what we're going to buy at the local farms or a grocery store for this week. And then that leftover day. So it's like that mindfulness being deliberate about your planning there. Um, and I love leftovers. Um, if you guys know Della Bowles, which I'm sure some of you guys might from, um, from Miami, what Della Bowles is, is a really awesome way of mixing and matching grains, plant-based proteins, vegetables, sauces, and some kind of boost. And so if you can learn how to, um, you know, kind of create these bowls using leftovers, that's also a really fun way to, um, to eat your leftovers and, and make it really tasty and fun and different each week. So um, I actually had some leftovers from this week. So I was gonna make a bowl real quick for you guys. Um, and so I was gonna talk a little bit about this before I go on. Um, I have some couscous from last night and I put it in this pickle container because we always get these containers, right? And so many people throw them away and it's so tragic. I use these as my Tupperware as long as I can. So I have my couscous from last night. Uh, and so I like to use this big white bowl when we're making bowls. And I'm gonna make a little bit of couscous to start. Um, I have some leftover uh, tofu. It's not much, but it's enough for a nice little lunch or dinner. Um, I went for Mexican food last week and I have this leftover slaw that was so good and some beans. That's gonna go right in there too. Where's my spoon? So I'm not, I'm not really gonna worry so much about like, you know, th thinking ahead of like, is this gonna go well? This is all delicious food that's gonna go deliciously together. I also have some human roasted farm carrots. I'm gonna add a few of those. I thought they were so good. My kids didn't love them because they put cumin on them. Maybe it was a little too much for them. I don't know. I thought they were delicious. Um, so that's my bowl so far. I also have these yellow tomatoes from the garden with some cilantro. I'm gonna add those right in there. So you guys are getting the picture. If you know Della Bowls, you can see where I'm going with this. Um, and then I like to keep some good sauces in the fridge. So this is not something I made. It's just like a store-bought carrot ginger miso dressing. Give that a little, a little whirl like so. And then I was at this other farm today and they gave me these beautiful microgreens. So that's going to be my boost. I didn't, I didn't buy any, but it was so nice. She gave those to me as a gift. So basically this is my leftover bowl, which is like from a few different meals, but you could see would be just an amazing thing to have for lunch or dinner. So don't be afraid to use leftovers. And if you just like put them in these kinds of containers, and keep them in the fridge, you can really like mix and match a whole bunch of stuff through the week. Um, another one of my favorites is fried rice. That's probably the most predictable. I also like curries. So I'll take all the vegetables and maybe dump a can of chickpeas in there, add some coconut milk and some curry, let that simmer and put it over rice. Um, and then of course you can just like throw it all together as big salads. That's also pretty predictable, but, um, but getting creative with those leftovers is really, it, it becomes something that if you just like deliberately save that day for the, the leftover day, you, you can start developing some of these fun um, combinations. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of like the planning, the purchasing, the storing is really important too. So um, not everything needs to go in the fridge and take up space. Sometimes we like shove everything in the fridge and then food goes bad because we can't see it. Um, but I like to keep, you can see behind me here. Whoa. I like to keep um, some stuff out. So this is my bowl of fruits and onions. Um, I don't usually keep berries out, but I was gonna talk about those. I always keep tomatoes out here on the, uh, on the counter. And did you know cucumbers also, you can keep out, which is a new thing I just learned. Um, melons, of course. And what's important to know about storing food on the counter or the fridge is that certain 
foods really release a lot more ethylene gas and those ones are gonna ripen the other foods around them a lot faster. So like avocados, bananas, um, melons, certain foods, which I'll list um, when, I, when I post this blog, but there are certain foods that ripen other things faster. So you can keep those together, but separate from the rest of the things. So the things that go in the fridge, like the berries, the greens, the herbs, the things that are gonna be more uh, quick to spoil are also those items that are more susceptible to the ethylene gas. So, um, <clears throat> so don't think you have to store all fruits and vegetables in the fridge, it's not true. Keep them out where you can also like really monitor and manage them and see when they need to be used. And when they need to be used, go ahead and use them. Um, you can always look up recipes if you're like confused about, um, you know, I've got a zucchini and a green onion and a pepper to use and I can't think of how that would go together. Like you can Google it and throw them all in a curry or a taco or something like that. So uh, it'll give you some creative um, motivation if you really just like base your meals on what's, what needs to be used. So the other thing I love to do with food that needs to be used is um, ferment. And so Dave Dobler, you asked if we're fermenting beer. No, we're not making beer today. Um, so again, I'm using like my old jars to make these ferments. These are dilly carrots. Um, the recipe is up on our blog. And this most simple way to ferment food is just with salt and water. It's super, super simple. I took these carrots, I cut them up, I did not peel them. Um, I stuck them in the jar and I put in two tablespoons of salt, sea salt, kosher sea salt. And then I filled it with water, I put in some dill and I put in some garlic. Um, thank you so much to Radiate Miami and Susan for teaching me how to do this. Um, it's, it's so simple and delicious and such a nice way to use vegetables when you have too many of them. These were some turnips that I got from our garden a few months, no, a few weeks ago, and they were just sitting in the fridge forever, did the same thing with them, and they're so delicious now. Um, you can also like preserve foods by making jams, you can make sauces, you can make soups and freeze them, that's a great way to preserve also. And um, I freeze a lot of food too, which is why I kept out the berries. So sometimes I don't get to my berries fast enough. You know, I'll have these in the fridge and then next week they're all soft. Not moldy, but like soft. So I just freeze them and then use them in smoothies in weeks to come. Same with bananas. We always need frozen bananas uh, for smoothies. Um, so those are just a few things to do, like keeping an eye on your vegetables and fruits, using them when they need to be used. And if you can't use them, think about pickling, fermenting, freezing. And then one other thing I wanted to just show you um, before I go is, oh, two other things. This is one of my favorite ways, let's see, to use vegetables that are going off. This is a gazpacho. I love gazpacho and I throw in tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, onions, garlic, zucchini, avocado, all the stuff and make a delicious gazpacho that I drink for days. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention is using the whole vegetable. Quite often we look at a vegetable like broccoli and we cut the tops off. But this part right here is just so delicious. So it often goes in the trash and you're throwing away like the best part of the broccoli. This is the stem. And one fun thing to do is to just peel it and cut it like this and then you can toss these with olive oil and salt, maybe some garlic, and roast it or saute it. You can add some lemon zest or sesame seeds or something like that, and it's really delicious. So you could have that one night for a meal and then do something with the crowns the next night. So you've already got two meals out of broccoli. Um, I did peel the stem there because this is really tough and not nice. This, however, I would recommend never peeling this or carrots or even beets, there's some beets. Um, just wash them really good <clears throat> and then use the skin because that is the part that grows in the soil and gets all those great nutrients. So instead of peeling it, just cut it. You know, you can cut it in cubes or in 
slices or <clears throat> that's a really hard yeah um, got this at the market today too. But anyway, it's so beautiful and really so much of the nutrient goodness is in those peels. So don't waste it. Don't throw your food away if you don't need to. So um, just be mindful about, you know, the, the whole process of the shopping and the cooking and the preparation and, and maybe meal prepping so that you can really plan ahead and take that time at the beginning of the week to be sure you're going to use all that beautiful food that's in your kitchen. So I tried to make that really short and sweet, but I will, like I said, follow up and maybe Maddie, you can help me promote the blog post when it's up so that we can maybe add some recipes and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick so that I can have it up for if anybody has any questions. So there's that. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll definitely, when we follow up with the slides and everything, I'll link to the general blog. And when it's posted, we can share that on social too. I'm okay. excited to read it. This is like, definitely, I'll admit, I am really, really bad about food waste and shopping like wisely. And I, this is, I need to improve here a lot. And now's a good time to do it. Yeah, so Maddie, we have a cookbook. Um, which I highlighted here. Um, and so it's on our Delible site and that information will be in the slides also of where to find us. Um, so you can order Delibles, but you can also learn how to do that meal prep um, for your own home kitchen and make those different kinds of categories to mix and match. So we, we have that for you guys too. Let's see, and we've got uh, a question, is it true that once fruits and vegetables are pureed, they lose their nutritional value? I always make two days worth of smoothie at a time to save time and clean up, but I fear my second day smoothie is not doing me justice from Sarah. Um, I used to hear that about juices. Um, I'm not really sure about smoothies. I believe that if it helps you make your life easier and it works for you then do that i do it all the time i make giant smoothies my kids like drink half of them i pour them all in a container and put them back in the fridge for tomorrow um like with their names labeled and so to the next day i'm like here you go save me time we didn't waste any food and i i don't know i wouldn't really worry too much about it not being it's still so good for you you know it's great and Katie asked if uh, fermenting is basically what uh, you do to make pickles. No, it's not. That's a good question. So for pickles, um, pickles are more like you boil vinegar and water and maybe sugar and salt um, and herbs and spices. And you take vegetables like they're great with cucumbers, obviously, but like cauliflower and cucumbers and carrots and celery. But you cut those vegetables and you pour the... Um, vinegar liquid, the hot liquid over it, and then you bring it to room temperature and then you can store it in the fridge. Fermenting is when you actually just use like a starter or salt and water and leave it on your counter for like weeks. That's the idea behind sauerkraut or kimchi. It's just, it sits there in the room temperature and ferments. I love making kimchi. I really need to share my recipe with you guys for kimchi. I, I like, I'm obsessed with kimchi. <laughs> See, and then Luis asked if you use or like the green bags to increase vegetable and fruit life. You know, um, we don't usually keep fruits and vegetables long enough um, to really worry about their lifespan. Like everything in my house gets eaten within the week. Um, I cook a ton. So I, ha I can't say that I really have that much experience with it. I, but I think that that's also goes along with that, like planning and purchasing deliberately because I know exactly what I'm going to use and in the order I'm going to use it. So. Awesome. Anyone else have any questions for Julie? I know, I know we're running a little late, but we had a lot of really awesome content to cover and you guys really stuck it out for a long haul. So I'm glad you all stayed and uh, hope you learned a lot. And again, I will follow up with a really wonderful email with the slides, with links from the chat, with contact information for the panelists. I got a lot to do tonight. <laughs> and 
Um, and this recording will be available on Facebook Live. It will be posted to our IGTV maybe by tomorrow. And then uh, I'll also send out a Dropbox link with the video file as well. So let's see, we got anything else? Yes, yeah, a bunch of thank you, very helpful. Um, I did have a quiz prepared, but it is 840. So maybe if you want to do the quiz, say so in the chat, or should we just do it? Um, it's a little late. Oh, Katie wants the quiz. <laughs> oh, Sophia wants the quiz too. Okay, we're doing the quiz, guys. I love the enthusiasm. Some of the questions are from many, many minutes ago when I started. So we'll see what kind of memory you guys got. All right, so I gotta share my screen. This is through Kahoot. You don't need the app, but you will have to log on to a website on your phone. So if you have a phone available, oh yes, there is a prize, Katie asked. <laughs> it's one of our reusable bags, which I actually have right here. Might not be able to see it with the smart screen. Fun little bag with the DFO Octi and some reusable straws. So I will share my screen. and go to our Kahoot quiz. All right, so I'll hit play. Post classes. Okay, so, sorry, this is probably a little loud. <laughs> so you'll go to this website and then you'll enter with this game pin. We got Kiara, Kiara and Mina signed up so far. All right, we got nine players. I'll just give it a second more. Well, players, awesome work, guys. All right. Oh, we still got a couple people joining on. All right, I'm gonna do a five second countdown and then we'll start the quiz. <laughs> right in the chat if you're encountering technical difficulties. Five, four, three, two. Oh, we just got another, okay. Five more seconds. <laughs> five. Oh my gosh, <laughs> TJ just <laughs> All right, I'm gonna give it a couple seconds longer because we're still getting a few people. Oh, and TJ asked a while back in the chat, do dogs, or what's the deal with dogs attacking rotating compost? Because my roommate's dog relentlessly attacks my rotating compost every time I compost. So if you're considering that, um, you might have to lock your dog out of the backyard while you tumble. Okay. Oh, we lost a play. All right, I'll start now. <laughs> so you're scored for your answer, but then also timing. So there's a little bit of a answer fast uh, incentive. Correct answer is 220 pounds. Good job. Mina's in the lead. I can read these out loud also. What percent of global greenhouse gas emissions come from food losses and waste? 1%, 6%, 13%, 
or 25%. Six percent. Good job. The tricky 25 percent was for just food in general. That's the 25 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Oh, now Dave's in the lead. Let's see. Bioplastics. Good job. Cotton fabrics. I think Sana, correct me if I'm wrong, but they need to be very small fabrics. Yeah, they can go in. Oh, we still got Dave in the lead, followed close behind by Tuna Jelly or TJ. In the US, what percentage of food waste comes from homes? Correct answer was 43%. So almost half. Let's see? Oh, tuna jelly took the lead. What greenhouse gas does organic material emit when in an anaerobic or without oxygen environment? Methane, the correct answer. Good job, everyone. Tuna jelly is still in the lead. Mina's making a bit of a comeback. What is an example of a nitrogen rich material you can add to your pile? Coffee grounds. All right, tuna jelly is still in the lead, but it's still close. It's a close quiz here. Got a couple more questions. <laughs> the, 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 the answers will be, what do worms apply to? Worms reduce organic waste quickly, remove heavy metals from dirt, produce fertilizer, all of the above. Also, I realized that this little worm cartoon has the little can stock thing over it, but I just thought it was so cute, so I used it anyways. <laughs> yes, all of the above. Oh, Tina Jelly's still in the lead. But we still got two more questions. True or false, worms are insects. False. They are annelids. All right, we got one more question. What's the most simple way to ferment foods? I'm actually not sure if we end up talking about this because we rush at the end, but we'll, we'll see. Sorry, guys. <laughs> nice, six of you guys got it. Lactic fermentation. Um, Julie, if you're still here and you wanna explain that real quick, I apologize if we kind of rush at the end, but let's see who the winner is. Casey, third place, followed by Jerry. Oh, Mina, good job. Two jelly fell out of the lead there. Congratulations, Mina, you win the little goodie bag, which is our 
a reusable tote and a set of two reusable straws and a reusable straw cleaner. Congratulations. Daddy, I'm here. I was eating my bowl. Um, but I, um, I'll include the fermentation step in the blog. I realize I totally rushed through so many things, but lacto fermentation is the answer to that one. Cool. Yeah, so for more information about that, tune in to Julie's blog in the next couple of days. Well, congratulations, Mina. If you want to send me your email real quick, Thank I will reach so out much. to you after this. Yeah. We never went over lactic fermentation. <laughs> 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 I, I, I had the answers to every other one. It was unfair. I went from oh. first to fourth with one question. All right, I will give with. you a bag. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you to everyone. This was actually really cool to be a part of. Thank you for organizing it, Maddie. Yeah, thank, thank you guys, so everybody. That was so fun. Thank you. Thank you. Jelly out. Bye. Thank you, Maddie. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you guys for participating and for tuning in till the end, and yeah, panelists couldn't have done it without your experience and expertise.